Mm. All right, folks, we are live. Welcome to our uh, last episode of our uh, study group on the German Revolution. Um, oh, we have Simba on with us. There we go. There's Simba. Hey. All right. Um, so we have finally passed this uh, remarkable, remarkable uh, landmark in our st study uh, of the German Revolution. We have finished this absolute monster of a book. Um, uh, we have now read it cover to cover. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so let's uh, I'm gonna pop this out, hide chat. There we go. Got that all squared away. Um, so um, we are here to present the final part of the book today. Um, so before uh, we get into it, I'm gonna just add that this is a celebratory uh, stream as well. We are celebrating uh, the absolute uh, accomplishment that we've all been through. You uh, reading along oh, with yeah. those of you who have been reading along with us, uh, that you have also slogged through this absolute um, big boy, this uh, 912 page opus of uh, incredibly academic history. Um, yep. So that is no small feat. So today is going to be, we're going to have some some time to do some some reflection and some, you know, talking about, um, you know, the, not just the chapters that we're summarizing today, but the, the kind of the, the whole book overall and how we feel about uh, the events of the, of the revolution and um, perhaps how we are viewing current events now in light of our enriched knowledge of leftist history. So, um, uh, as usual, I'm going to give uh, my co-hosts a chance to introduce themselves uh, real quick, um, and then we're going to go ahead and get started with our summaries of chapters 43 through 47. Um, so, uh, Izzy or Simba, you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, do names, pronouns, and uh, as usual, a quick sentence or two or why, about why you think it's important to study the German Revolution. Uh, all right. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Izzy Fall. I am a, a YouTuber. Uh, uh, she's a, I, I, I uh, am currently in the middle of moving and rebranding so things are mixed poorly i think uh that studying the german revolution uh gives us insights on the uh ways that uh the potential ways that current events can uh play out the potential routes they can take and uh can allow us to formulate ways to potentially prevent that yeah Simba, you want to go ahead? Um, yeah. Hey, I'm Simba. Uh, I do stuff on the internet sometimes, and I finally have like a stable life situation. Uh, so I'm probably going to be making stuff on my channel soon, which is Young Simba on YouTube. Um, and did I already say they, them? Young Simba, they, them. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, the German Revolution is important because... How do I put this? I mean, I, I very recently read uh, for, you know, maybe the second time in my life, uh, Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder, uh, where Lenin in like 1920, I think it was, goes back and uh, says like, here are like the universal lessons that we can learn uh, from the Russian Revolution and stuff. And a lot of uh, his criticisms are of like the, the various German uh, social democratic parties, or I guess communist parties, a, a little bit of both, I guess. And um, 
the German Revolution is just a really good example of like in a pre Bolshevism or pre Marxist Leninist like situation, like what kind of mistakes can like be made and and how can that be contrasted with the other revolutions of the time, uh, especially one like the Russian Revolution, which was successful. Um, and additionally, uh, I think that the more revolutions that you have to, to study from, uh, the better results you're, you're likely to get, I'd, I'd like to think. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for introducing themselves. I uh, just wanted to welcome uh, Brianna of Brianna's Library and uh, Alice Evelyn, uh, who are both here in the chat, as well as uh, Juju, who's another uh, regular attendee of our uh, study group. So I just wanted to make sure I recognize everyone in chat. Um, and uh, hello to S Spice 8 Rack. <laughs> um, welcome. Uh, welcome to anyone else who happens to be joining us. Um, uh, just real quick, I'm Melody, she, her pronouns. This is my channel on YouTube called A World to Win, where I mostly host these study groups um, and put out very occasional videos on um, leftist uh, history and political theory and that sort of thing. I try to strike a good balance between, um, you know, uh, accessible stuff and academia. I kind of uh, <laughs> try to play the role of uh, public intellectual without, uh, um, you know, put, putting too much distance between myself and non-academics. So uh, that's what we try to do on this stream, is try to make this uh, as accessible as possible without watering it down. Um, so I'm going to go ahead before we uh, before I start rambling and uh, start getting into our chapter 43 summary. Uh, Kyle, of course, uh, unfortunately, is a regular co-host. He couldn't make it today. Um, so I'm going to be covering his chapter um, called History and Politics, which is chapter 43. And if you want to follow along in the book, that is on page uh, 839. Um, so uh, Bruet starts by emphasizing kind of the, one of the biggest problems about writing the history of the German Revolution just in general is that uh, the rise of Nazism uh, destroyed not only like people, obviously, it just absolutely, uh, you know, they murdered uh, thousands of uh, communists and social democrats and leftists of, of all kinds, as well as uh, Jews and disabled people and other ethnic minorities and whatnot. Uh, so there's a problem that, you know, many of the people who were there uh, are physically erased from, from history. Um, there, uh, much of the many of their writings were were destroyed, burned, or excised by the Nazis. Um, uh, so there's a, a huge complication there in writing this history. And it's further complicated by um, the politics of the Communist International and the direction that the Soviet Union took in the aftermath of the revolution, which um, is hotly, still hotly contested among leftists to this day. Um, however, Bruet stresses that one of the things that really complicates the specific reading of the German Revolution is uh, how... Um, Moscow wanted to kind of uh, wash its hands of any responsibility it may have had in directing uh, events during the German Revolution um, and kind of, um, you know, uh, this is again, this is Bruet's reading, it's not necessarily my reading, I'm not necessarily endorsing this, but uh, it seems to say that, you know, Moscow basically passes the buck and says, look, Germany was fucked from the beginning, let's just, you know, uh, it's the labor aristocracy, it's the this, it's the that, it was doomed from the start, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, yeah, um, and the furthermore, uh, complications uh, arose in kind of rewriting 
uh, the history of the, Re of the revolution uh, in the DDR, the German Democratic Republic, uh, official history of the revolution, and uh, the kind of the power dynamics within the party, the um, party apparatus over the years. Um, I think that it's really important in this context to emphasize that, um, you know, Simba had kind of asked in one of the first streams we had of this uh, book, like, okay, we kind of know going in that Brouet is, is a Trotskyite, um, so where does that come out? Uh, and it wasn't real apparent at first, um, both because we didn't know the history ourselves and because we weren't you know, none of us were really at, are really super attenuated to uh, differences between, you know, so-called Marxist-Leninist historiographies and Trotskyite historiographies and so on and so on, right? Um, I mean, we're, uh, I guess, kind of aware of the, the generalities there, but when it comes down to the, you know, the real nitty-gritty stuff, like, th this is exactly the kind of stuff where you know, different interpretations of um, the historical events are like, it becomes a real apparent where those differences are and where, where the, the different readings of these histories come from. But it also, in my opinion at least, becomes very hard to kind of interpret them dispassionately, but while at the same time kind of like really understanding what happened um, and like <clears throat> trying to you know, uh, understand where these people are coming from when they're saying, well, I think X, Y, and Z happens, and that's what, and that's, these are the political consequences that follow from it, versus other people who say, no, 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 that's all, that's all wrong, that's all revisionist, blah, 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 blah. And I want to say right up front that I don't necessarily have the wherewithal to um, parse that all. It's very complicated, and as I have said in the past, I'm not a historian. Um, I'm somebody who is, uh, uh, you know, who does their homework, does careful reading, and so on, but I, I don't pretend to, to know more than I do. Um, so uh, this, uh, a lot of what this kind of recurring question that seems to be central throughout the readings of the German Revolution, and this is where chapter three, uh, chapter 43 kind of wraps up, is talking about, okay, um, is revolution in uh, the imperial core even possible? Uh, the kind of what Bruet calls the Stalinist reading or this Marxist-Leninist reading, whatever, is, is again, that kind of fatalistic uh, approach that, oh, it was never possible, why do we even try? This is bullshit. Um, and the kind of more, I guess, um, uh, Trotskyist interpretation that uh, the possibilities were were much more uh, open um, and different kind of interpretations, uh, you know, right wing and liberal historians who of course have their own narrative that they want to put forward about it. Um, I personally, I, I don't know if this, you know, uh, I tend to agree with our uh, occasional guest, uh, Axel Fauschultz, uh, professor of history at uh, SUNY Potsdam, uh, that the possibilities were definitely a lot more open, um, and that I do actually, even, you know, having gone through this whole book, I do think revolution is possible in the imperial core. I don't think that the existence of the labor bureaucracy necessarily, like, inevitably dooms revolution in the imperial core. I think that it complicates, it creates serious complications, undoubtedly. And I think especially in the United States, for example, um, and I mean in general as well, but especially in the United States, that the role of white supremacy and its, its question tied up with this notion of labor aristocracy and where you know, the white working class within American history has played a, a, a very, um, you know, reactionary and, and kind of backwards role in um, class struggle and has, you know, very often engaged in, in counter-revolutionary um, 
violence against, you know, black workers and indigenous people and so on and so on. Uh, right. So there, there's all kinds of, of new fields of questions that this, this opens up for me. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think that that's, that's really what, what Rue is doing with chapter 43 is situating where the German revolution fits into these kind of bigger historiographical questions. Um, and again, uh, historiography, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, historiography is simply, um, quest, uh, it, it's, it's his, like, what are your methods of history? What sources are you considering? Um, who are your heroes? Who are your villains? Uh, what forces do you consider to be uh, kind of, you know, predominant, um, you know, uh, culture, uh, economics, religion, etc. Like, which are these, which, you know, uh, forces and actors are, are most important, which ones uh, are unimportant, right? These are all questions that historiography is, is, is interrogating. Um, and I think it's really important. And I think we have, over the course of our stream here, really centered uh, the importance of historiography, and it's something that I've developed a much um, keener interest in as a result of reading this book and consulting its sources and so on. Um, so yeah, uh, next we've got uh, chapter 44, which is called Grafting Bolshevism onto German Stock. Izzy, I believe this is your chapter. Are you ready? As ready as I can be. Um, right. um, and we can take a minute to kind of let things breathe um, if we want. I have noticed that a couple more folks are joining us on the chat. Just wanted to welcome yeah. them all real quick. We just got to, we just summarized chapter 43. Now we're going to be talking about chapter 44. Um, welcome everyone. If you've never joined us before, this is our uh, bi-weekly uh, study session on the German Revolution. Um, but yeah, I'm going to ask uh, Simba and Izzy real quick if either of them have any comments that they wanted to, to make on that before we move on to Izzy, Izzy's summary, or if we just wanted to kind of keep chugging through the summaries, or, um, you know, I want to get some feedback there. And by the way, chat, of course, you are also welcome to answer quest ask, ask questions, um, give your thoughts, you know, feel free, you know, just of course, be respectful, don't uh say say mean things in the chat um you know uh, put out your questions there's no bad questions uh we won't necessarily be able to answer every little thing because again we're not historians we are just ordinary people reading a book um so what we will do our best to answer them um so please feel free to contribute your questions and comments in the chat um simba or izzy do you have anything that you wanted to um expound on in, in that um, from that discussion, or do you want to just kind of move on to the next chapter? Uh, I actually wanted to ask, uh, do you remember if he mentions anything in particular that uh, the Nazis might have destroyed or like any particular events that might be affected by an absence of evidence or anything? I think, so this is me just doing my very best from my, my, my own notes, which is that uh, it's pretty general. Uh, that lots of things like newspapers and letters between comrades and, um, you know, those sort of things were systematically um, destroyed um, by the Nazis or by, um, you know, uh, peop even the party itself because of, you know, the needs for secrecy or, you know, self-censorship with regards to, like, their relation uh, with Moscow, which, of course, you know, Brue paints in a very unfavorable light. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's my, my read on this chapter is that the, uh, the, the lack of, you know, the, the destruction of documents and, and people, of course, is, uh, I think he, he's pointing to it as a pretty general symptom. Understandable. That's all good. Sure. Um, Izzy, did you have anything that you wanted to contribute, or do you want to just go ahead and get into your chapter summary? Uh, I just, I just want to go ahead and get into this. Yeah, go um, for it. All right. 
Um, I do have to note, though, going into it, I um, I do kind of like how uh, Bure, uh going into the chapter kind of clarifies that there is not, like, this black and white uh, good and evil type deal, and that there is a lot of, like, there's, like, a myriad of events that culminated in these series of events and that's uh, that's what makes it interesting and a lot of people have a uh, tendency to like uh try and view historical uh events through those lenses and sometimes like it's all it's, it's unavoidable but like for the most part like it it, it definitely helps um uh oh my god so uh Gray um, referred to uh, German social democracy as uh, a, a crisis. Uh, I like that. Um, I am dreadfully sorry. It's okay, hon. It's a safe space here. We're all friends. Yeah. Take a take a second, regain your footing. It's all it's all good. We can. Yeah. Let things breathe a little bit. Just relax. And remember, we're here to, very, like, once again, celebrate this incredible uh, journey that we've taken together over the last uh, eight months together. So this is uh, this is a, a happy, pressure-free stream. So right. <laughs> take, a, take a second, you know, get yourself cent centered. Chat's being very supportive. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm not too terribly great live. Um, it's okay. I've been working on it myself. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, I I talk terribly live, <laughs> but you know, just try your best. <sighs> but okay, yeah, and uh, he does, however, go on to say that uh. Uh, German social democracy, um, like up until this point, and and still kinda was was an expression of German workers' movement, and uh, like for reasons that he, uh, uh, for one they were like pretty serious about organizing. They demanded discipline from uh, party membership, and uh, but the calls for reformism and revolution uh, simultaneously, uh, well, the the contradictions became very apparent uh, pretty, pretty rapidly as things started to deteriorate. Um, and uh, elements that were contained within the party uh, started to kind of fraction off and um, just sort of do their own thing, it seems like. Um <sighs> You're good, huh? Yeah. I'm not having the best time with this. Uh Emil, can you take over? Yeah, sure. Um Yeah, so Uh, throughout this chapter, um, Bruet really s uh, centers kind of the difficulties of translating um, the successes of the um, Russian experience into Germany um, and the differences between kind of the development of the uh, social terrain of the workers' movement in Germany versus the workers' movement and revolutionary movement in Russia. Um, there is, uh, because of the kind of bureaucratism and conservatism that had been engendered by the Social Democratic Party and its kind of cozying up to capital and the right in general, um, there's this kind of um, just an inherent distrust towards um, centralization and uh, unfortunately also towards organization in general. Um, and it's this is exactly what um, Lenin and, uh, in fact, uh, Radek as well, Karl Radek, um, talk about being this kind of 
uh, juvenile uh, left, um, you know, like ultra left uh, tendency, which is um, this uh, kind of maybe a little premature desire to to launch into revolutionary action and w where it's really not uh warranted by the by the alignment of forces um where at the same time like this very understandable distrust of of bureaucracy and conservatism um is perhaps like not misguided in, uh, unto itself right they have very good reason to you know, uh, be distrustful of, of, you know, these kind of conservatizing tendencies that had, you know, resulted in, um, you know, the, the uh, party growing progressively more accommodating to capitalism and, and war and so on, right? Um, and then there's another um, kind of el another element that's complicating things is the uh, new the NEP in Russia, the new economic policy, which was, again, I'm not an expert here, but I'm, I'm going to do, do my best to kind of take a shot at it. The NEP was a series of kind of um, economic reforms that the uh, early USSR, uh, or I guess it wasn't quite the USSR yet, it was still uh, in this uh, state, I think being the Russian Federative socialist republics or something rfsfr i'm getting something wrong but RFSFR. anyhow yeah, um yeah. they're enacting this uh policy which is seen as kind of a step back towards capitalism um it involved things like certain concessions to the peasantry um and you know uh relaxing of things like grain requisitions and, and whatnot which had been um like really central to the so-called war communism uh, during the Russian Civil War. Um, so a lot of people in uh, the kind of the Western European uh, left had some mixed feelings about this um, NEP thing and that, you know, oh, Soviet Russia, this, you know, great bastion of, you know, uh, of world revolution is is doing some capitalist stuff or that's concerning um and is also you know uh having to maneuver diplomatically with with the other imperial powers so like there there's kind of this doubt cast on uh at least in, in certain sections of the of the western european left about um you know what kind of attitude to take towards the russian revolution uh but uh, it's worth stressing that the Russian Revolution is still, uh, especially by revolutionaries, still overwhelmingly viewed in a in a very positive light, and um, uh, and Moscow, all the while, is is very much rooting for the German cause. They're they are uh, very much trying to get uh, Germany. They they really want uh, Germans the Germans to win their revolution. Um, so there's all, all kinds of things that are, uh, complicating the relationship between, um, kind of the, the German left, um, and, uh, in, into its, in, in and of itself and its relationship to Moscow and just kind of its political line in general. Um, is you still with us? like we lost her i'm back oh you're back yay um yeah my uh my phone tried to connect to the neighbor's wi-fi oopsie right. no it didn't oopsie so yeah um and all the while there's this like uh among certain sections of the german left like this tendency to view like well the russians did it this way so we have to do it this way too um, and this is something that, uh, you know, Paul Levy, uh, as Simba will get into very shortly, uh, Paul Levy criticizes this as being kind of dogmatic and undialectical. Um, <laughs> Levy himself is, is criticized for being kind of a bourgeois, dilettante, intellectual um, layabout, uh, which I think is, is, is unfair, personally. I think 
and Brue seems to agree. Brue seems to hold uh, Levy in, in pretty high esteem, despite his mis uh, many mistakes. Um, but anyhow, so there there are these tensions between. I think uh, this chapter is really emphasizing kind of the problems of trying to of the Germans trying to in some ways emulate the uh, Russian model uh, while at the same time trying to keep their own house from collapsing in on itself, um, right? So there are definitely a lot of different kind of lines of cleavage that are um, messing things up for the German party uh, in many ways. Um, and I think it's Levy, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong here, I think it's Levy who says, um, the KPD, the Communist Party, is an excellent workers' party, but not yet a communist party. I think something like that. Um, and like, it's worth noting here that I think that there's this, I think, kind of notion that I had going in that the KPD was, uh, you know, kind of aloof and sectarian and disconnected from the working class, but I think kind of going through this book has kind of shown the opposite, which is that they were very firmly rooted in the working class. Um, and the fact that they also had, you know, uh, sectarian and insular tendencies actually doesn't contradict that. It simply complicates the picture. Um, and, you know, Rosa Luxemburg famously uh, before her untimely death in January of 1919, uh, famously cautioned of the kind of dual dangers, one of which is the condition of, of, of a party, you know, being too loosey-goosey and being too, you know, um, you know, uh, too vague and too, uh, and whatnot and kind of falling in, and, and kind of just dissolving into the popular um, movements and kind of becoming more like, you know, smoke among the mass rather than like a real coherent organized force. And then on the other hand, kind of the danger of becoming a, um, you know, a, a self-contained little, you know, LARPy sect right? Like some, a, a bunch of, you know, very radical communists who uh, nobody listens to and uh, people think are weird and culty, um, right? So I think what this chapter emphasizes is that those are still questions that the German party was, and not just the KPD itself, but the German socialist movement really struggled with um, all throughout this period. Um, Izzy, did you want to get back on, or, or, um... Uh, I, uh... It's okay if not, you can just say no thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good on that. I'm not happy with that time right now. No worries, hon. We're, That's, we're with you. It's, yeah, um... Trying not to break down live on the internet. All right, well... This is again a, a safe space. For I, I I know, but <laughs> all right. Um, so I just wanted to give us a second to uh, think about this chapter a little bit. Maybe if either of you wanted to comment on it, or if Simba, if you want to go ahead and start talking about Paul Levy, that would also be just fine. Um, I'm happy either way. All right. Um, I mean, I I personally am ready. You know, I'm good. You got. Yeah, it. you can All go right. for it then if you want to. All right. Uh, so chapter forty-five is like sort of a, a mini biography. Like there was there was the like really small biographies at the beginning of the book that were like one or two um paragraphs or something and then this whole chapter is like paul levy the missed opportunity question mark uh kind of yeah i think it's literally the, the name of it is paul levy the lost opportunity question mark uh and and uh the the topic of this whole chapter 
kind of is summed up in the first sentence. So this is going to be one of the only times that I, you know, quote at length the book. Uh, so it starts by asking, was Paul Levy a communist? Uh, this question needed to be asked from the moment uh, he refused to take the hand which Lenin extended to him uh, by way of his correspondence with Perizetkin. Radek regarded Levi, uh, Levy as not as a communist, but as a bourgeois dilettante playing at revolution. Trotsky compared him to uh, Frassard and Serrati as no more than one of many left-wing social democrats who were caught up by the Re Russian Revolution and carried uh, by the mass movement beyond, beyond their own limitations, but whom the ebb uh, tide was to return to the fold. Finally, the historian Richard Lowenthal regards Levy's adherence to communism as a misunderstanding due to his ignorance of the uh, reality of Russia. As a disciple Levy's of Luxembourg, uh, he could believe himself to be a comrade in arms of the Bolsheviks only because he had never truly understand, uh, understood what, what Bolshevism was. Uh, so that's like, so, so it goes through a, a whole bunch of disagreements that Paul Levy had uh, with his own party, I think he, it kind of goes over a little bit of why the KPD and the KAPD had their split, uh, which Lenin and I think Radek uh, criticized him for. Uh, he, and it goes over, you know, him being like very, how do you describe it? I guess at a, at a certain point, very anti-ultra-left um, kind of tendencies and ultra left just to clear it up is um a tendency where it's like people people will do like really really revolutionary things but it's like it's not uh it would be actions that are too radical at the time that they're happening so so things like i think there was one occasion where like cops were being captured and you know like going guns blazing, I guess, in a situation where the popular uh, opinion isn't quite on your side or isn't quite there yet. Uh, and he was very, very anti that. So uh, during the March action, he was very quick to denounce the people who took part in it, uh, which once again, Lenin and Radek, who were on the further left end of the spectrum, were, were like against his denunciation of the March action. Um, and around 1921, Lenin said about Levy that he had lost his head about putschism and that um, Levy had something to lose, quote, which was sort of an allusion to his, uh, as it's previously been said, bourgeois dilettante kind of vibe, which, you know, is, is factual. Uh, Levy was born to a kind of wealthier than average family, went to school with wealthier than average people. Uh, he became a lawyer, which sort of put him in the petty bourgeois kind of like strata. And he had a taste for bougie things. Um, he, but, but I, even though that's the case, he was, you know, to his credit, um, when World War One broke out, he got drafted and he exiled that and hung out with with uh, Lenin and a few other folks in Switzerland, uh, which Switzerland wasn't involved in World War One. So they successfully, you know, evaded the law and everything. <clears throat> so, so, but that's just how he conducted himself uh, on the topic of policies and his disagreements with the parties that he was involved with. Uh, he was on the further left end of the spectrum than the SPD. Um, so he, he did join the, um, the Spartacists at the time that that became a thing in like 1918, uh, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah, 1918. Uh, he hung out with folks like Clara Zetkin, who were on like the far left end of the spectrum. Um, disciple of Rosa Luxemburg, also a lover of Rosa Luxemburg, but Rosa definitely deserved better. <laughs> not to say that I, I'm not a fan of Levy. I think he's a pretty cool dude, but I will say that Rosa like definitely deserved more. Low key, uh, fuck boy. <laughs> yeah, low key. <laughs> for real, for real. Um, and Bruet writes that Levy's final difference was perhaps perhaps the most decisive in the succession of events which led to his break with the International, uh, and that was the one uh, that was most closely connected with what was happening at the time. Already in the summer of 1920, when the Bolsheviks were convinced that a pre-revolution uh, 
pre-revolutionary situation was arising, Levy believed that the revolutionary wave in Europe had already passed, that capitalism had begun to revive, and consequently, that the proletarian revolution was not on the immediate agenda. Uh, so obviously after uh, the outbreak of, like, or after, after World War I dies down, people are angry. They're like, what the heck did we do that for? You know, like why are, and of course there were anti-war protests in Germany anyway, like that whole time. Um, Germany loses a whole lot of, it just has like everything to lose basically. Uh, it's the economy is, is terrible. So people like there's a giant revolutionary wave of anti-government sentiment. And it's very clear that something's got to give. Um, and and he like Paul Levy's opinion is that you know by 1920 in the period uh, from 1917 to 1920 things have come down by that point enough that we sh like we shouldn't be focusing on revolution like first necessarily he was much more like a, a long term planning kind of guy and people were like what the heck man like <laughs> you're a communist what are you what are you a communist for if not to overthrow the government that you live in? Um, and that's that's kind of like where the um, chapter uh, leaves off. But I, I think that by the end of the chapter, you kind of get the sense that despite the fact that Paul Levy had like a lot of um, incorrect like opinions and takes on things uh and maybe towards the end of his career took like a little bit of a rightward turn uh it's no small feat to take command of the kpd immediately after the death of rosa luxemburg and carl liebnitz and for for that you know you gotta give it to him yeah just a little bit absolutely know? so so yeah i think that at the end of the day when the sun sets Drouet, uh, has some respect for Paul Levy, despite his flaws. Yeah, and I, I think that that Le Levy is is one of the more interesting characters in in Bruet's narrative, and like I would t I tend to agree with that um, with his overall kind of sympathetic portrait that he paints of Levy. Um, not again, just going off of what he says, um, and not really you know having any other sources, but you know, and admittedly that's that's problematic, but um you know uh Carl Raddick who I I will be talking about in just a minute uh was uh I think kind of infamously said uh Levy wants to uh educate the workers until they're white in the hair with wisdom uh until their hairs turn white with wisdom uh so and I think yeah it's it's very relevant I think both in terms of how Levy as an individual was viewed within the German movement and how he was viewed by Moscow, which is that because of his kind of class status and like, you know, uh, uh, what, what have you, uh, it can be, uh, he was kind of always treated with an air of distrust um and yeah uh i think it's also interesting how um Brue kind of contextualizes levy and lenin which is that like lenin despite being you know salty with with levy for breaking discipline actually is on the same page with him about a lot of other stuff and like following like I, I I'm I think this is after the March action. Like, uh, Lenin basically says, "Well, yeah, he should only be expelled for breaking discipline, and he should be allowed to join the part, you know, join the party again when he's, you know, shown that he's corrected his kind of individualist um, behavior." But he's like, you know, I think Bru Bruet, I think, kind of stresses that. Lenin and Levy are kind of on the same page about a lot of stuff, including um, kind of this uh, um, opposition to to putschism and kind of this preemptivism uh, that the uh, kind of in 
increasingly kind of, you know, as Simbo was saying, ultra left tendency within the German movement was um, gaining steam, right? Um, and I think that, and this is my me doing my best to recall from my some my own notes on chapter uh, forty five, which is that. Um, Levy had the appearance within the party of being kind of anti, like, being anti-putschist at the same time when the, that was what the so, the social democrats were, were, um, touting was that, you know, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't be out demonstrating in the streets. Like they were obviously advocating it for much different reasons and for much more, frankly, for much more like politically conservative reasons whereas i think levy was really take was really thinking deeply about these things tactically and as simbo was pointing out like levy really has kind of a, a longer term vision for um what the party and what the movement needs to do um and levy i think key to this is that levy from the from the very beginning really opposes this so-called theory of the offensive which is this, um, you know, um, political analysis that looked at the conditions of post-war um, Western Europe and said the bourgeoisie is weak. We need to hit them hard while while we have the chance, um, and there, it's going to be up, up, and away. And long live the the Russian Revolution! It's going to spread this wildfire across Europe. And it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Everybody, just get get on board. Revolution now! 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 Um, and Levy um, saw this as, uh, shall we say, wishful thinking. Uh, and I think as early as kind of 1919, um, Levy was, was was seeing kind of the the uh, downward trajectory. And uh, I think by 1920, Levy is really saying ha, that um, that the post-war revolutionary wave maybe maybe it it, it was a thing. But now it's over, and we need to to really dial it down on this theory of the offensive. And that's exactly when the ultra lefts within the party, I think, are are saying the exact opposite. They're doubling down on the theory of the offensive, which of course leads to the March action in 1921, which is disastrous, and they lose what two thirds of their party membership over the next couple months or something like that. Yeah. It's yeah, it was yeah, a shit show of epic proportions. Levy goes, told you so, told you so, told you, told you so, and gets kicked out of the party, and it's 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 quite a mess. Um, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and, and summarize the last two chapters. Uh, chapter forty six is called "Uh Oh." Satanic Buck says I can barely hear anyone. Um. I'm sorry, folks. We're we're doing our best. Um, I know Simba is coming through extra quiet. Um, hello, Logan Elizabeth says hello, everyone. I'm new here. Welcome. Yeah, I'm seeing there's a lot more people than usually coming on. We have uh, eight people um, watching uh, according to YouTube. So uh, welcome, everyone, newcomers. I'm. Uh, <laughs> Sorry that you didn't find out about our, our study group sooner. Uh, we've been doing this since uh, December, uh, but you know, hopefully we'll have more study groups coming up uh, in the nearish future. So hope you can join us for those. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that um, more folks can can hear us. Um, I know Sim we've been having issues with Simba's mic, but uh, or I don't know if it's Simba's mic or if it's. Uh, something to do with the connection. I've got, I've got them turned all the way up on my, um, on, on my, uh, discord here. So I don't know if that's what's up. Um, all right, well, we'll do, we're, we're doing our best here, folks. Um, so let's get into chapter 46, Carl Raddick, the confusion of styles. Um, uh, Radix, so Radix kind of despite um, being like kind of a, a major figure in uh, in all of this is um, Bruet says he's largely kind of a forgotten figure of, of this period 
which is unfortunate because according to Gray, um, Raddick has is a, just kind of an incredible intellectual uh, powerhouse. He's quick-witted. He's um, an exceptional orator. He's um, you know just he's a very experienced political activist. Uh, Brue, however, says that despite all of that, he's also um, not a terribly strong leader, especially kind of in period of crisis and under you know a lot of pressure, which of course is is exactly when you need to have good political leadership is in periods of crisis. Um, he was you know a sharp thinker with you know very you know very well read, very good at you know, uh, very well theoretically based um, and always had, you know, a very keen political analysis. Um, but at the same time, uh, he really lacked that extra, you know, um, confidence and um, oomph that would have allowed him to have, you know, again, this is uh, as, 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 uh, as told by Brue, Raddick didn't have that extra, um, you know, backbone that would have made him a much more effective uh, le political leader. Um, oh, hello, Eve. Welcome once again. It's good to have you. Um, and he's also kind of a bad boy. Um, he's described by uh, a British spy as a cross between a professor and a bandit. <laughs> Um, he's known for uh, also being uh, kind of gross looking. Um, very, uh, he's like, uh, according to Brue, very unkempt and kind of ugly. And you know, wait, Carl Raddick? Yeah. What? Yeah, no, I think. Did you I read the was... chapter? <laughs> I I don't. Not remember to just call you out, saying... comrade. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good, but I don't remember him saying that he was ugly. Yeah, Maybe no, I... let me let me find the exact page cuz I'm actually kind of want to read this now. Um He's he quotes at length a uh, German journalist uh, Wilhelm Herzog uh who paints a very glowing picture of Raddick. Um He says this is a flattering port uh, this is um Brue writing in response to the giant uh quote. Um this is a flattering portrait but no doubt uh, a truthful one, though it perhaps should be slightly filled out with a reference to his physical ugliness and his neglect of his dress. Um, <laughs> so, okay. stinky gotcha. boy. <laughs> He's a, a ruffian, I guess. Um, Brue also describes him as a um, a bohemian outlaw. Oh yeah, look at that ugly mug. I think he looks pretty cool. He's maybe got the the he looks like a like a like a surly old sailor. <laughs> he does look like a sailor. I think I don't know. I think like the pipe really like puts the look together. That's yeah, my opinion. The yeah the cap the the that style of hat and all that stuff. I think is all very kind of characteristic of the period. Sorry, I'm, I'm no, I'm it's good. It's good. Um. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't think anybody can out out Fox Young Stalin though. Oh, he's yeah, a babe. Not. Total yeah, Young babe. Young Stalin, twelve out of ten, absolutely. Um, although you know that famous uh picture of of you know like Young Hot Stalin is actually not him. Do you know that? Oh. I did not know that. It yeah, it's that like way. it's like uh he had like a fall guy who was like ridiculously hot <laughs> oh gotcha gotcha um young stalin was still pretty cute though um anyhow <laughs> <laughs> um anyhow uh uh Brewer says that the other revolutionaries um <laughs> kind of thought of radic as being a little a bit of a douche um, especially Zetkin. Zetkin, uh, at some point, um, like, she found out that they were in the same, uh, 
city at some point for some conference. And when she found out that he was there, she became, she, she, Brue says she became violently angry. <laughs> like, I'm like, really? Clara Zetkin is just an incredible, incredible. She's fantastic. She's such an incredible character. Um, and I'm, I really don't want to imagine her violently angry. That sounds terrifying. Because she's like four foot eleven or something. She's tiny. Tiny little German Jewish woman. Um, <laughs> anyhow, um, Brue talks about how uh, Radek uh, had uh, kind of anticipated the arguments that um, that um, Lenin would make in uh, left-wing communism and infantile disorder, which if you folks don't know about, I will post a link to in the chat, but it's basically, it's written in 1920 by Lenin, uh, and it's, you know, it's very much a critique of that tendency of, of ultra-leftism that's kind of brewing, um, And uh, Radic, so yeah, Brue says that Radic very much anticipates this uh, as early as 1919. He's already describing kind of analogous problems. So um, here's the link for those of you who want to go look at um, left wing communism and infantile disorder. It's actually not very long, it is um, also pretty readable. Uh, and frankly, I haven't read it since having read this book, which I think will lend a lot of new insight to it, because I think, actually, I think that really, and this will be kind of self-evident when I finally say it out loud, it'll be, almost seem kind of silly, but um, you really, I don't feel like you can really read uh, left-wing communism and infantile disorder without understanding the German Revolution. I think that it's the only thing that contextualizes it properly. I agree. Um, I absolutely agree. And yeah, like I think a lot of people, um, in especially in the Western left, kind of read left wing communism at like at, totally abstracted from this history, and they maybe have like kind of an idea of what Lenin's talking about, but like I certainly didn't the first time I read it, um, and I was. I could kind of see what Lenin was gesturing at, but at the same time, um, yeah, I, I, I have a, I think I will have a new appreciation for this text reading it again um, after Same having here. read this Same. book. Um, so, yeah, do you have any thoughts having, on that? Um, yeah, I was just gonna say uh, after having read this book and like bits and pieces of like the people's history of. Uh, the German Revolution, and then that one other book that was like a narrative, I don't remember, but you recommended it to me. Uh, the Lost Revolution, the Chris Lost Harmon. Revolution, yeah. A good amount of that. Like, uh, yeah, and uh, I just read Left Wing Communism last week, and it really just like understanding the German Revolution and then reading that again, like after, like it just really puts everything together, and it's like, oh, like. He was making an actual, like, a very potent series of points about this, um, especially in understanding, like, the individual figures and their positions um, within the German Revolution that he, he writes about. Yeah, I, I think that I have a new appreciation for left-wing communism. Yeah. That I didn't I, have before. I also feel like, um, do you remember from... A I'm probably probably gonna lose some folks in the chat here when I talk about this, but do you do y'all remember um Herman Gotha from earlier in this book? The, uh, I vaguely remember that name. What did he do? Yeah. He he was another one of the like kind of ultra left folks that basically when Lenin wrote left wing communism. Gorda responded with a with a big uh like okay boomer tirade in response. <laughs> um 
true. I, I vaguely remember that, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to go back and read, oh, hey, Zanzi is here. Hello, welcome. Um, we're just kind of getting to the end of the uh, stream here. Or the end, not the end of the stream, but the end of our summaries. The last chapter is entitled, um, oops, <laughs> balance sheet of a defeat. Um, right, and so I'm gonna try to do. I'm gonna do my best here because I don't have a written summary of it. But I think that Brue is overall trying to, um kind of summarize, not necessarily like summarize the whole events of, of the of the entire revolution, but really uh showing that um this revolution was could have like its defeat or victory could have absolutely radically altered the course of you know obviously world history but specifically the history of you know wh wh uh, of the communist movement and that you know it's likely that if it had won for example that nazism might not have succeeded in uh becoming i mean i i think it, i would argue that nazism i think it would obviously i think it i i, I do think it would still be there, but I think it would have maybe been easier to defeat, or perhaps, I, I don't know, again, like, pure speculation based on my reading of this book, uh, and I think it's also likely that, oh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, I was going to say that um, Germany probably would have split up regionally sooner. Oh, yeah. Uh, rather, yeah, yeah, rather than, like, Germany completely going one way or the other because like Germany as a concept is a brand new idea basically right uh, it was like a whole bunch of broken up like kingdoms and some and uh like the more catholic areas of Germany like really didn't like Nazism at first at least around the time that we're talking about and um I don't know where the favorability of communism was highest I guess like Bavaria Saxony like the south or whatever but yeah, I think it would have balkanized and broken back up a little bit, and there would be more fasci parts of Germany and like more communist parts of Germany. Yeah, I think that's inescapable. I also think that I think one of the kind of the key moments is the occupation of the Ur, um, because you know the kind of like German. You know, Germany was already economically devastated by the war and the reparations and indemnities and all that. Um, and then, like, just being occupied by the foreign powers, other imperialist powers, was like, I think, both, you know, I think it really poured water on the workers' movement, which was already kind of discouraged and um kind of dejected from from the the incredible uh economic devastation and the just overall like disintegration of german society um and that because of the nature of uh the occupation really inflamed those uh nationalist sentiments that allowed um you know the nazis to really get a toehold in there um and I think that that's also critical to understanding the so-called Schlageter line that the communist and like why it was such an epic failure on the communist part. Like, um, so just to re recall real quick, um, Schlageter was a kind of a right-wing guy, right-wing like soldier, I think, counter-revolutionary who was uh, killed. Um, and even though he was kind of um you know right wing he was still kind of like uh you know uh, an on, an honorable you know widely viewed as kind of an honorable soldier so to speak um and so uh the line that the communists adopted and I'm I'm really doing my best here I may have screwed that up but like um 
the a line, the so-called Schlagerter line that the communists adopted was basically, uh, and uh, you know, honoring him and and taking up this line that basically uh, tried to outflank the Nazis, or not just the Nazis, but just the nationalists in general from the right by saying, you know, uh, you know, trying trying to do trying to do nationalism while also trying to do communism. Um, and it was, it just kind of made them look strange and silly. Um, it, they, I think they adopted this line for kind of understandable reasons, because I think they were trying to kind of head the Nazis off at the pass, so to speak, like, to kind of, like, don't, you know, try to basically be like, hey, don't fall for their bullshit, you know, you should be on our side if you really want to save Germany, so to, you know, so to speak. Um, and I think the re that maybe that was kind of correct in principle, but in execution was sloppy and, and you, you can't, if, you know, if people want nationalism, they're going to go straight to the, to the, to the source, right? Like, uh, if the not the Nazis could serve nationalism better than you can, don't try to out Nazi them. <laughs> uh, for lack of better, don't try to out nationalist people who are program programmatically nationalist. Um, so that was uh, caused a serious setback for the party, I think. Um, and then, um, I think Bruet in this in this last chapter also really highlights, um this increasing tension between um moscow and uh the german and the german party um and how uh and this is this is where i'm critical of bruet in in in, in a regard because he very much uh like he says he says something to the effect of the uh, they didn't have a Lenin, so they couldn't have won, which I think is Bruet falling into great man history. Like, I think Bruet actually does that more than he would probably admit. And that's something that I think just, I'm going to, I'm going to actually use this as a, as a transition into our discussion, which is that despite being, you know, a very, um, astute Marxist scholar, I think Bruet at times, anyhow, falls into kind of great manism, and like many kind of um, Trotskyite historians, I think he tends to kind of uh, overemphasize Lenin and um, and his his role in in the in the international um, in, in in general, and I would. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but it just there. There's something that stuck out to me about this last chapter was definitely that it felt like Bruet was doing some great man history, maybe without really intending to, but I, that was how it came across to me. Anyway, I just wanted to say, uh, wow, ten people are watching. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, more think more people than we've had in quite some time, so. Um, thanks for coming around. Uh, we just got through summarizing these last, uh, I think, five or so chapters of the book. Um, and, oh my gosh, I just wanted to once again say that this is very much a celebratory stream. Um, uh, you know, this book is 912 pages long, and it is not... Uh, as we as we have discovered, it is not easy to read. Um, Bruet is very academic uh, and very devoted to um, you know details, which is good as a historian. It's it's really enriched our our understanding of this period. Um, and I think that you know, um, despite the fact that none of us are really um, you know historians or academics in that way, uh, I think that we have. Uh, done a, a fair job, I'd say, in um, kind of detecting where his biases are and where, um, you know, where he goes wrong, maybe. Um, 
and, and, and I think we definitely have a lot of really interesting kind of lines of inquiry to pursue uh, rereading, you know, documents that we've read before, like left wing communism. Uh, another one that I really want to revisit is called is another um, kind of late Lenin document called uh, the Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky, um, which is basically um, Kautsky and a lot of the other kind of centrist social democrats um, in Germany during the time of the Russian Civil War are basically um, doing uh, both sidesism at the Bolsheviks. They are at this point anti-Bolshevik, which means uh, that you know between the Bolsheviks and the fascists that are trying to take over Russia again in the aftermath of the revolution, like yikes. Um, <laughs> anyhow, so Radic. Uh, is wagging his finger at the Bolsheviks for being dictatorial and blah, blah, blah. And um, Lenin basically retorts in this, um, uh, in his article, his pamphlet, uh, listen here, you little shit, you are a snake of the highest order, and let me show you why. Anyhow, I think that's another document that I want to revisit. I haven't read it in a while. Um, anyhow, I just wanted to thank my amazing, beautiful co-hosts and my amazing, beautiful, um, audience who have been so incredibly, all of you have been so incredibly supportive over the last, you know, eight or so months that we've, um, been reading this, this just astounding, uh, book and, and we're working through our, this incredibly, you know, tragic period of, of world history. Um, so, uh, I just want to give, uh, both the chat and my co-hosts, uh, you know, time to just, you know, free, free form, you know, uh, what are your thoughts about this book and either in general or what, what, you know, what new things are you curious about or things that you maybe would, never would have thought you'd be curious about before that you're now you're curious about, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and chat, feel free to, to also say that, um, you know, give, give your thoughts, give your questions. Um, so Simba, oh, I think we lost Izzy here. Uh, Simba, what do you, if you want to, um, you know, muse on the, on those, uh, questions. Um, I'm, interested uh, much more than I was at the beginning in alternative like historiographies of the German Revolution. Uh, like, I think that like, like, for the most part, like this was not like, super Trotskyist. I do agree with you that in the final chapter, um, he definitely like gets into almost hey again, like, my phone okay. died. No, it's okay. Um, Simba was uh, talking. Uh, we were just going through uh, just our th general thoughts and reflections on on uh, our experience reading this book. So, uh, sorry, Simba, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I think that he like almost gets into like some great manisms, um, but but like definitely like I didn't I just I don't have like a keen eye for like what's Trotskyist and what's not, except for when he has, like, the really, really hot takes, like, the common turn did absolutely nothing of value, like, past 1922, or whatever that, that dumpster fire of an opinion was. <laughs> you know, um, I'm, I'm sorry to all the Trotskyists in the chat, actually. I, I apologize. Uh, whoever, what was, should turn, oh, Izzy. Um, chat was saying, turn your volume down. Sincere apology to all the Brouet stands and, and Trotskyists in the chat, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, yeah, so Izzy, you don't have to if you don't want to, but we're just kind of going around and giving our general thoughts on, um, you know, either the part, the chapters that we read this time or the whole book or, 
you know, things that maybe you're curious about now that you weren't before or that, you know, uh, things that you learned that you thought throughout this whole process, either about the revolution itself or other events or maybe just about the way that you study and learn or or anything really that, you know, you feel free to express yourself in whatever way you think is, um, you know, appropriate. We, uh, right again, we're here to, to celebrate our accomplishment, right? It's, it's been a, a very long and difficult road. So, um, you know, feel free to, to share any, any, any and all of those thoughts here. Uh, The one thing that keeps popping into my head is how dense the book was because like I have a really short attention span so it took a lot of effort. <laughs> um same. Uh it was very uh it was a heck and chong uh as uh yeah, that's all I got right now. I'm sorry. That's cool. Yeah, I think um, it being so dense and then having finished it makes me want to go back to stuff that, that I found uh, confusing, especially some of the chapters in the first half of the book that are written uh, not chronologically. I feel like now I have a better grasp on, uh, you know, the sequence of events uh, that went down and stuff. So definitely that, that would be interesting, especially like uh, when they're talking about even before like the actual German revolution, but getting into World War I. <clears throat> so yeah, of course I don't own the doorstop uh, of a book, but, but I feel like I would benefit from having like a physical copy to, to go back on. I'll order you a copy if you want to Venmo me. Oh, we, we can talk about that later. Yeah, okay. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, uh, let me see. I'm actually going to, speaking of this book, I am going to go ahead and um, post a link to it, the the PDF of it in the chat. Um, I've been meaning to do that this last couple of times, and I've forgotten to every single time. So apologies for that, folks. Um but uh, my only only thing I must regretfully say is that it is not properly indexed, so uh, you'll have to scroll through everything by hand. There's no like proper proper like bookmarks and stuff in it. So um, yeah, that's just an 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 unfortunate um, consequence of, of that. So I just go ahead, went ahead and posted a, a link to. Uh, to the PDF of the book in the chat. Um, yeah, and I, I just wanted to, to say that, like, we as a group have been not just, you know, we started actually the, the four of us, the, the I guess, founding, uh, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, found, founders of the study group, uh, me, Simba, Izzy, and Kyle, um, actually started this way back I think last September or so uh, and we read uh, not even a whole book we just read a selection of chapters from a book called On New Terrain by Kim Moody and we read that with um, my dear friend and um, old uh, professor of uh, economics uh, professor uh, Yusuf Kodafaras uh, who I uh, Hopefully we'll have on again in the future. He's uh, delightful. Um, but yeah, this has been a little bit of a uh, an experiment uh, in learning uh, because I've seen other folks do something like this too online, right? Uh, a kind of a publicly accessible study group that, um, you know, like you can tune in on a regular time and hear us talk about this book and you know in 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 a way that i think especially for a big academic book like this which is so as izzy pointed out so dense and so you know non-chronological and and, and very inaccessible to non-specialists you know i think kind of 
um, the method that we do this with uh, as being kind of non-experts um, looking at this book, I think really kind of tears down some some barriers and maybe uh, my hope is that it makes the prospect of, you know, people who don't necessarily have an academic background, um, uh, you know, go ahead and, 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 you know, try to take a crack at this, uh, at this kind of book, uh, and can maybe inspire some confidence in, in people who maybe otherwise would have been, um, you know, too intimidated to try to take something like that on. Cause it can be, it can be incredibly intimidating. Um, right. Like, you know, people, I think, especially in kind of leftist circles, there can be this kind of, uh, you know, uh, intellectual snobbery of well oh, you know, look at me I've read Das Kapital and and you know Dialectic of Enlightenment and 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 you know uh, you know a grad student's reading list worth of, uh, of of you know dense historical theory and and you know look how smart I am well you know that's uh, not a not a good way of of going about uh, you know spreading. Uh, knowledge and class consciousness, in my opinion, right? I mean, it's all having theory and history under your belt is all well and good, but uh, I think the whole point is to um, uh, is to is to transmit it and 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 not in a in a way that's just like oh look how smart and clever we are, but you know like in a way that really taking seriously the task of um, introducing this material to uh, to the general public. Anyhow, what uh, any anyone want to riff on that a little bit? Uh no, I I think that you summed that up pretty well. Brianna says she fully agrees. Well, thank you. Um, I also wanted to take this time to I think I already said you know th thank you to our uh our my co-hosts here who have done the hard work of reading this uh, monster of a book um, and coming on <laughs> with us every couple of weeks and, 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 you know, setting aside their time to, to read and to thank. Um, I'm very gracious about uh, for that. I'm very gracious for my audience who has kept tuning in week after week Um and for bearing with us through all the technical difficulties and our own kind of occasional uh, fumbling of the of the text, right, is all part of the learning process. Um, and uh, I also wanted to take a, a second to thank all the other uh, YouTube creators who have joined us on, along the way. I wanted to especially thank um, the Radical Reviewer, uh, the, the best the, the goodest boy on the left, uh, the radical reviewer uh, came and did uh, uh, one episode with us. I wanted to also thank um, Alki Historiker, uh, other history YouTuber who uh, is uh, actually a spe is actually a specialist in German history. Um, I'd like to also thank. Um, Trekkie69, who came in and did a couple episodes with us, and I'd like to uh, thank Queer Potus, who came on with us last time uh, and talked about it, and uh, would also love to thank, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Herr Professor Axel Verschutz, uh, Associate Professor of History at uh, State University of New York in uh, Potsdam. Uh, and I just wanted to say to everyone who's listening, either uh, live now or if you're listening to this afterwards, and, and you want to leave a comment on uh, the stream on the on YouTube, um, if you are interested in participating in our study groups in the future, uh, coming coming on live with us like we're doing here, uh, please feel free to contact um, myself. Um, either uh, on YouTube or through Twitter. Um, I'm gonna actually go ahead and throw up my channel promo here um, that you can uh, support our show. Um, you can support me financially by uh, becoming a monthly subscriber on Patreon at patreon.com slash a world to win. Uh, and if you can't do that, that's fine. Uh, money's tight these days and 
uh, understand if your financial priorities are uh, not such that they can accommodate that as an expense. Uh, but if you can't do that, just uh, make sure to like the video, leave a comment so that um, you know, you can kind of increase the visibility, subscribe to the channel and click the bell so that you get notifications and make sure to share this video because, um, right, like th this is ordinarily, you know, I'm so sure as you're aware if you're watching this, this is a pretty obscure topic that doesn't get uh, a whole lot of attention and uh, we, we, we think it does. We think it does deserve a significant amount of attention. So, um, I, yeah, that's that's my that's my that's my plug for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I just I thought we'd rack, kind of wrap up the discussion with uh, you know kind of your parting thoughts on what do you think that you know now that we've absorbed this tremendous uh, text into our kind of um, theoretical historical vernacular uh how do you feel going forward um in the the socialist movement here today um and in light of the especially um kind of insurrectionary uh <clears throat> vibe that's in the uh, atmosphere right now uh kind of all over the country and uh the struggle against fascism and uh yeah all that um good stuff. I think there's a lot to dig into there. Um, but, uh, yeah, just kind of, I think we should close out by kind of giving out, giving our, uh, thoughts on that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that this is a whole ass topic, uh, to, to say the least. And, uh, it really like approaching approaching this and like uh, reading how much detail and stuff that Drew put into it. It um, I feel like I definitely definitely unlearned at least a little tiny bit, like the habit of you know, with the benefit of high, hindsight, doing alternative history and acting like oh well they should they clearly just should have done this, because uh, like anything that you could say that about that happened in the chain of events that we call the German Revolution, like, there there obviously would have been problems with every option that anybody to the left of Sauron could have taken uh, at the time. And, and like, uh, you know, understanding that and the fact that Bolshevism or Marxism-Leninism or whatever was, was basically, like, in its infancy and people didn't really know how applicable um, any of the tactics of the Revol Russian Revolution were. Uh, I, I think that, like, the thing to, like, the major takeaway, if there is one, uh, that, that I would figure is for this, is that uh, contradictions constantly change. Absolutely, like, nothing stays the same for any period of time. Um, yeah, like, the only constant is change, as, as they say. Uh, and so you have to be very malleable with, with what your tactics are in trying to advocate for a better world. Yeah. Um, Izzy, do you, do you want to share anything on that? Or it's fine if you, if you don't, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity if you'd like. Uh. You can say no thank you if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, no thank you. All right. Well, I guess I, this being um, my stream, uh, and that I uh, and my channel, I guess I'll kind of give myself the last word, which is that um, I have learned so much on this um, journey that I've taken with you all, um, and. I think that uh, there is a uh, real, really just so the present moment is is pregnant with so many um, just astonishing possibilities uh, for you know if not uh, revolution with a capital R 
uh, that certainly there are the makings of a revolutionary process at work uh, in the present, uh, led foremost by the uh, struggle for Black lives against police brutality and and murder. Um, and I think that, um, you know, this, uh, there is always, you know, recurring, as, as we know, as most of us uh, are Marxists of some flavor here or influenced by Marx in some, some, some tremendous way, that, you know, cri capitalism crisis, crisis is, is absolutely end endemic to capitalism. Um, and that, you know, not every cap not not every crisis in capitalism uh, leads to fascism necessarily, and not every single crisis in in capitalism leads to the possibility of a socialist revolution um, or a proletarian revolution or what have you. Um, but there are uh, always opportunities for struggle and for for the uh, you know I I think that. My what I've really taken away from this history is that uh, fatalism uh, it dooms you before you're even off the ground, and fatalism even in in, in either direction. Because one of the, the things that Brue says in the, in this last chapter is that some one of the assumptions that the um, that a lot of the um, German uh, KPD leadership had was that well, um, you know, the material conditions are just going to organically give rise to revolutionary situation, um, which uh, I think is really, uh, it kind of led to a, a sort of passivity on their part. It's not to say that, that they didn't do anything, uh, of course, but it's to say that, uh, you know, you can't just kind of be waiting in a messianic fashion for you know the capital r revolution to just be delivered to you in the form of you know um you know serious economic or social crisis because the existence of those crises especially um you know in the event of something uh akin to the the occupation of the Ruhr, uh is really uh you know leaves the door open for you know other people who maybe have very different agendas from you, like, you know, say, fascists who, uh, you know, are, uh, have the potential to be anyway, uh, much more organized and much more prepared for that moment of crisis than you are, uh, in Definitely. which event uh, you're uh, really in hot water. Um, and I think and, and, and so that fatalism, I think, can kind of go either way. I think it can be a kind of overly hopeful fatalism of, you know, crisis will just kind of organically deliver us, um, you know, revolution gift wrapped to us on, a, on our doorstep. And I think there's also kind of what we today kind of refer to as, you know, being blackpilled, right? Like, oh, everything's fucked. We, we're going to live in a fascist hellscape, you know, uh, why even bother, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's just kind of this resignation to, um, you know, to, to the inexorability of, of crisis and decay. And I think, right, like that's, that, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think that we can, we can all see that pretty plainly. And, right, and I think that I have, in my kind of political, my own, like, real-life political journey, encountered a lot of people who, even if they don't say it out loud, they kind of implicitly admit to being blackpilled um, in some regard. Like, um, they, uh, <laughs> they kind of through either through their their other words and actions kind of imply that they've given up hope um or that they've kind of you know they're not really approaching struggle in earnest because they uh they really um you know they don't think that we can win but i think that that's uh again like uh, uh my final takeaway and i guess this is kind of the note that that i'll close out on is that um you know we have to recognize that the future is full of possibilities, um, disastrous ones and uh, wonderful ones. Um, 
And I think uh, as Professor uh, Ferschultz said in our, in our previous stream, uh, you can't, just because you believe in something doesn't mean that it will come true. But if you don't believe in it, it makes it a lot harder for it to come true anyhow. I'm kind of paraphrasing him there. But, you know, you have to, I really think that you have to have kind of the, the revolutionary imagination to think that the impossible is possible, right? Um, and there's maybe some utopianism in that. But I think that, that without that, you're staking your dreams on nothing. Uh, and that, you know, I, I, we have to believe that we can win, right? Um, and if, <laughs> there's a, a, a quote that I'm, I'm sure I'm probably stealing from somebody, I can't remember who ex exactly, but um, <laughs> no cause is, is truly lo lost if there is but one fool left to fight for it. And I'd say that revolutionary socialism uh, is is just such a cause um, and that I will gladfully, um, you know, put my every waking effort into. Um, and so, yeah, I just, uh, Simba, you missed my whole <laughs> closing tirade. It's okay. Um, you can watch it afterwards. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, basically, uh, you have to believe that, you know, as revolutionaries, we have to really, we have to believe in the revolution and we need to, you know, not be blackpilled. <laughs> revolution is possible. We can do it. Um, you know, it doesn't Agreed. mean that we're just like inevitably going to win, right? We can't fall into that, into that kind of, you know, either triumphalism on the one hand or kind of defeatism on the other, right? Those, those are two, two, kind of two, uh, two sides of the same coin, um, as Comrade Stalin would say, they are both worse, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh... right? Um, so yeah, just, um, I, I guess those are kind of my closing thoughts and, uh, Simba and, and Izzy, I, I gave you kind of both the chance to, to, to give your, um, your last, um, thoughts on this. So I think we're going to call it, uh, an evening. Um, and yeah, mm -hmm. if there's any, any other things that you wanted to say before we go, uh, go ahead and, uh. I'd say feel free to go ahead and make a plug for yourself, either your you know YouTube channel or your Twitter or all, all of the above. Um, and I just wanted to, again, thank our audience so much for, for joining us on this incredible journey. Word. Um, Izzy, did you want to go first? Or? Oh, no, you, you go ahead. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm Young Simba. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to upload again. Now that I have like a stable life situation and stuff, that should be a whole lot easier. Channel is uh, Young Simba, Twitter Young Simba as well, uh, and I have opinions on the internet. Cool. <laughs> I am Izzy Fox. I uh, have my Twitter is at Izzy underscore the underscore Fox, uh, like Guy Fox, the famous terrorist. Hey, um, uh, but no, I do YouTube videos. I'm working on one currently, but I'm also in the middle of a move. So it's uh, I yell at communism at I yell about communism at bugs and uh, pack things. Uh, it's 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 gonna be weird. It's gonna be weird. Um. Uh yeah. Uh yeah. That's, that's pretty much it. Um, I, I, I've, uh, you can, you can find me at the same name on, uh, on YouTube. Great. Right, so, yeah, I finally got all that lined up. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you again so much for joining us. And remember, uh, we have a world to win. <laughs>